Welcome to another episode of Trinity Radio. I am Braxton Hunter, and along with me is... Jonathan Pritchett. And we're here to talk today about an issue that is central to what we do here at Trinity College of the Bible and Theological Seminary, and central to what I do on the road as what I call an evangelistic apologist. But this was not my idea. Dr. Pritchett brought this up. I think it's a good idea, yeah. and we hope you enjoy the show. The reason why we wanted to talk about evangelistic apologetics, or at least I wanted to talk to him, number one, he is the foremost expert on uh, evangelistic apologetics now because, well, number one, he wrote the book, Evangelistic (laughs) Apologetics. But number two, just from my personal experience, um, I have a background in apologetics. I went to Biola University and got an apologetics degree. The apologetics school for a long time. Well, it was. We are. <laughs> but, <laughs> I said for a long time. Yeah, but but when I got finished with the program, now I can't speak for all the gung ho Tim Strattons and people like that who are just rah rah Biola mm-hmm. and rah rah apologetics. But I left Biola not liking apologetics, and in fact decided to pursue other. You know, it really threw me off endeavors. when I first started talking with you that you would say. I don't like apologetics. Actually, what you'd say is apologetics is stupid. Yeah. <laughs> it really, it really threw me because I lived for apologetics, and know? I did too until I went and studied it. <laughs> well, what what do you mean when you say it? What, well, what, what I, happened? To I you? always say things. Do, did William Lane Craig abuse you? No. Did Mike Lycona abuse you? No. <laughs> um, I always, when I say something like apologetics is stupid, um, of course I don't mean it quite at that level. You dial it back by 10. That's what I learned. I told Dr. Pritchett this about three weeks after he came to Trinity is whatever he says, I got to turn it back a few degrees and then I get the reality. Yeah. But I always say things so facetiously and hyperbolically though. Yeah. But I mean, I did think apologetics was kind of dumb after I got done with uh, my degree in apologetics. But you meant the way it's handled. Yes, because I, I looked at myself I looked at everyone that I went to school with and I looked at some alumni and I realized what what are all these people doing with their apologetics degree besides fussing with people on Facebook? That is the principal thing people use Uh, apologetics for. One guy, one guy who was, uh, he was a youth pastor. Uh, His name is John Labonte. Great guy. We share the same birthday, uh, except he's many years younger than me. But um, he was the only guy I know... Uh, that was actually doing something that mattered. And he was a youth pastor for a while in a church in Tennessee. Um, I can't remember the name of it, but you had heard of it when I, I mentioned But then he went to go start a church plant in Las Vegas. Um, but he was the only guy that I knew um, that I went to school with um, that either, A, didn't end up teaching uh, at HBU, um, Everyone ends up teaching it. If you got a degree from Biola, you end up at HBU, right? Uh, if you're female, <laughs> there's like a there's like a trap door in the basement of right. Biola with a speed train that goes yeah. to HBU. If, yeah, but then all the, all the all the dudes, um, <laughs> all the fellows like me, argue on the internet. Yeah, and I was like, yeah, this is get getting nowhere. But then, you know, I discovered you on the internet through your dad. Mm-hmm. Um, and he said, well, check out my son. Uh, he, he, he's an evangelist, and he likes apologetics. Y'all might have something in common. And then well, I... back up. Really, the first time I remember encountering you, I had written for a, a blog called SBC Today, an article that had like... It was in a series, and each of them had a lot of comments. But the article I wrote with both, they, they issued it twice. Both together, it was over 800 comments. Yeah. And primarily what it was was me in, in the trenches duking it out with people, defending what I'd said in the article. But as I'm fighting and wrestling for my life over, really honestly, three days of defending myself on this on this. At the time, this is like the number two religion blog in the world. Right. I think for that couple of weeks that this was going on. And I'm defending myself left and right. And as I'm fighting, I look over and I'm sweating and I'm drenched in mud and you know just going out. And here's this other guy in the trenches with me. 
I'm speaking metaphorically in case you're confused, yeah. fighting alongside of me, and, and, and it's Jonathan Pritchett. And so I asked him originally, would you like to do a blog together? I'll write some articles, you write some articles. And he said, yeah, I've got my own blog, thanks. <laughs> I jerk. did have a blog back then. It was great. <laughs> yeah. Pritchett Prime had his infancy back then. Yeah. But anyway, so we met and you dug what we were doing. Yeah. Uh, but I can go back. I think I showed you this one time after I first got here that I had actually had spoken with his dad before I ever spoke to you by like a day. Mm-hmm. Because I was talking to your dad. He's like, yeah, you, 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 you should meet my son. Y'all have a lot in common. You were talking. He was yeah. probably trying to get you to come to Trinity. To t- like as a student? Um, no. Uh, he did say um, if I was interested in that, I needed to talk to him about it. But mm-hmm. uh, it was more just he started talking about you. Mm-hmm. Um, but I did I did ask him about Trinity because he was the president at the time. Yeah. But but um, he said, yeah, and if you're ever interested in, in, in a program, come on. Um, and I eventually did. <laughs> but, but, um, but then I started talking to you, and... I became, I don't know, it was like uh, a light went off that here's a guy that's actually doing something meaningful with apologetics. And you were actually doing evangelism. And you always talk about, first and foremost, being an evangelist. And then you would segue into, into uh, uh, apologetics as uh, just kind of incorporated into it as a means, to, as like a vehicle to deliver the gospel message. Yeah, yeah. And, so and you liked that. I, I, I in fact, I, I liked it so much. It's like, oh, here's something that you can do. Use, and I'm not trying to knock Biola, and I'm sure other people um, leave there with with excitement and wanted to be um, evangelistic and reach people for the gospel. I just never saw it. Well, I see myself you know? kind of in the tradition of Josh McDowell, frankly, yeah. uh, because Josh McDowell used to do this sort of thing. He would go and preach somewhere. Um, now he always, you know, he has these other talks where he kind of does with his manuscripts and, you know, he has yeah. great PowerPoint and statistics, statistics, but <clears throat> he would go preach somewhere and give an altar call and, but it would have apologetics in the message and all that. And, uh, saw him do this at the national conference on Christian apologetics one year. And I'd already started kind of thinking toward that. And so that's kind of what I started doing. And of course I say in the tradition of Josh McDowell, just because he has kind of more or used to have, I don't know where, how he is now, had kind of the flavor that I have of preaching and all that sort of thing. But well, William Lane Craig himself, and we'll see this in a quote here in a little bit, he's kind of the same way. He actually uses decision cards. You know, mm-hmm. why does he ever get flack over this sort of thing? Maybe he doesn't. We just don't know about it because he doesn't feel like he needs to respond to it. But, yeah. um, <clears throat> but, but decision cards, you know, like a gospel tract. Yeah. You know, so, it, but anyway, so what happened to me was I was an evangelist. I had been a pastor. I became an evangelist. And I was preaching and seeing people come to know the Lord Jesus Christ. But a friend of mine, and people that have listened to the show for a long time know this about me. I had a close friend in high school who was homosexual. And he began to become very antagonistic about my faith. Not He didn't have all the rigorous arguments, but he would challenge me. And it rattled me. And when I say it rattled me, I don't mean that I began to experience serious doubt. But what I mean was I wanted to be able to give an answer to him that I didn't know how to give. I wanted to be able to give a defense, but I hadn't been trained how. So I picked up apologetics and began to use them for my evangelism. And nobody had told me at that time, you know, you can't do that. That's that's You're not supposed to include those. Those are two separate things, apologetics and evangelism. Well, there's plenty of people who will line up until like the last year where you've been on the speaking circuit shooting that down. Right. But I can remember a good friend of mine, I'll say his name, I really love and respect this man, uh, Dr. Malcolm Yarnell at Southwestern Baptist Theological S- Seminary. And him and I got into it. uh for some reason, I, you know this because you work with me, but I mean, sometimes I just can't help myself. I have to argue even with my friends. This is true. I just always get into arguments. In argument. fact, immediately before this podcast, yes. we had an argument. Yes. <laughs> and so I started arguing with Dr. Yarnell because he was saying that apologetics and evangelism really didn't have much to do with one another. And I've, <laughs> wait a minute, uh, no. <laughs> Uh, first, let me tell you, there's a guy who does this, <laughs> you know. And yeah. second, um, if you look through the book of Acts, all of the sermons mm-hmm. are evangelistic and apologetic in nature. Yeah, and I'll give you a Witherington quote here in a minute that will demonstrate yeah. that. And and 
I'll go you one better. I don't know if Dr. Chatham who teaches, and Steve Selby, who teaches our personal evangelism courses, want me to say this, but guess what? Uh, the record of apologetic evangelism sermons yields converts in the book of Acts. Testimonies, <laughs> where Paul does give his personal testimony, the results are nowhere near the same. Uh, yeah. So this. Yeah, you, you tripped over this fact. When I was preparing yeah. to go speak at New Orleans a few months ago. I was like, okay, Paul gives his testimony towards the end of the book of Acts several times. And in <laughs> no case does anyone really get saved. You're saying he has more converts when he uses apologetics. <laughs> yes, that's what I'm saying. So, um, yeah. And so I started bringing this stuff up. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute, back up. Because I want to say something about Dr. Yarnell. Who's awesome. Southwestern. Well, I want to say something, because if, if he ever sees this, which that's possible, he could see this... He, I was involved in a book. Hand me that book. The, the, anyone can be saved. Um, okay. This this is a book that I was involved with with several other. Um, uh, I'll probably throw an image up on the on the screen here. But um, this was a book I was involved with with David Allen, Eric Hankins, and Adam Harwood, as long as along with a bunch of other guys. Malcolm Yarnell is here endorsing the book on the back, and he tweeted right after this came out. He tweeted uh, Braxton Hunter's. A case for human freedom in um, <laughs> chapter eight or whatever it is in the book is worth the cost of the book, and that was like <laughs> that was like the greatest thing ever. Like that, yeah. I plan. This is true. I plan to print that out. That tweet. I've still got it, and put it and frame it and put it on the wall. Yeah. Because it wasn't like he was looking for things nice to say about each chapter. Right. He, he said just, that about my chapter, and I don't know that he said yeah. anything else about anything else. And that just really meant a lot to me. And there's been a couple of times he's promoted stuff that I've done. So this is not about Malcolm Yarnell, but Malcolm Yarnell, no, I think you are a rock star. I think you hung the moon. You. You're awesome, except that I like to argue with my friends. And, and he, even he, and I think he's probably, after getting to know us, has probably come around a little bit on this. But I do remember that Facebook discussion with him. And by the way, go go get God the Trinity biblical portraits. It's a fantastic. Yes, everybody says book. nobody yeah. can explain the Trinity. Well, Malcolm Yarnell seems to think he right. Can, he's so. got a great book. So <laughs> go get that book. This yeah. is not. But I'm just saying, even people I admire have this pro. And I think you said it might come from something Billy Graham might have said that that repeated the, this off. If, I, if memory serves me correctly, there is a. Uh, I don't think it was Billy Graham, but it was from the Billy Graham ministry. Right. There was like a pamphlet that went out that was saying it was it was listing things that aren't evangelism, but are sometimes confused with evangelism. And apologetics was one of the things that was mentioned there. Which we'll get to the distinction in a minute. But yeah. let me just let me just read you a quote that I think will demonstrate to you the importance of including apologetics and evangelism. You can still listen to the debate I had with a young man named Will the Atheist, very philosophically minded. At the time, he was the administrator of one of the largest atheist forums on the internet, uh, the Happy Atheist Forum. And it's, uh, it's a follow-up discussion with Will the Atheist. Uh, you can find that on the debates page, BraxtonHunter.com. And he said this at the end of a lengthy discussion. Now get this, you don't normally get atheists encouraging you to be more evangelistic and to use more apologetics. But here's what Will the Atheist had to say. In order to have discussions like this, we each need to understand each other's perspective. And I think I understand your perspective pretty well. And from your perspective, you know, oh my gosh, I could be going to hell. So of course you're going to try and convince me. I think it would be a moral obligation of yours. Not only that, it's throughout the entire Bible. It's practically an order from God. I think if you weren't doing that, I'd be a little bit confused. I would think this person is especially a cafeteria Christian. You know, who picks and chooses from the Bible what fits their palate and just sort of throws away the rest. This from an outspoken atheist propagandist. If you're not using evangelistic apologetics to persuade and convince me of the truth because I might be going to hell, then you're just picking and choosing from the Bible what you like and throwing away the rest. Right. I mean, that is powerful stuff. An atheist telling you you're not a serious, biblically-minded Christian if you're not using apologetics. But where does the problem come in, number one? There's two problems I see. Uh, number one, problem number one is that idea that lingers that apologetics and evangelism are oil and water. Mm -hmm. uh, and problem number two, why so many apologists end up fussing with people on the Internet and doing little else? Um, 
That's just my experience. And I look at uh, people that I, you know, was going through the program with at Biola. And again, I'm not knocking on Biola or those people. I'm just saying, I don't see that evangelistic passion spring up from apologetics, which was why I said, you know, facetiously or somewhat hyperbolically that apologetics is stupid. Why I thought that was what I really meant to say was I didn't see the point because I'm not going to go debate Richard Carrier tomorrow. You know, yeah. I, I might debate him at some point, but I was saying the the people I interact with on a daily basis, whether in my church or in my community, what was the point of all this? Yeah, that I can that I can have it's, conversations where people attack, you know, if your faith, and then I can get into another argument with them. Or yeah, if you're the, not doing it, like okay, t- typically when people think of apologetics, there's two purposes. Yeah. One of which some people don't think counts. One purpose is to firm up the faith of the already believing. So somebody in your church is doubting, a friend who's a Christian is doubting, and so you use apologetics to kind of firm up their faith. And, and that's a, that, that can be done. That's an important thing. Um, Gary Habermas, I think, has a page where, on his site where he lists all the people who he knows who have never doubted uh, anything about the Christian faith. And that page is blank. Because one of the enemy's favorite ways to attack us is with doubt. So right. firming up the faith of the already saved is a valuable use, and I've used it for that too. And it's been a blessing in my own life. Well, but, it's actually turned me onto the path of apologetics because uh, I don't know, I've probably said this story before, but I was going through a period of doubt uh, in my early 20s, and my dad came to me and said, I don't know how to answer some of these questions you have, but here's a couple books that I know that might. And one was Josh McDowell's Evidence Demands Verdict. And the other was Case for, uh, Christ. Case for Christ by Lee Strobel. And for no other reason than the Case for Christ was had a more recent copyright. I said, so, well, this is old. It can't be good, even yeah. though it's an awesome right. book and Josh McDowell's the man. But I grabbed the Case for Christ and I, I you know, um, read through that. And I was more fascinated with the people he interviewed than I was mm-hmm. even with his own personal narrative about being an atheist journalist and his wife. I, you know, I'll go see the movie, but that whole story didn't like stun me like it did other people. Yeah. Um, but I got really interested in the people he was talking to. And so I just eventually just started seeking out people like uh, Habermas and William Lane Craig and Ben Weatherington and others and reading what they wrote mm-hmm. because I was more interested in that material than I was. The, and it's a good story. I'm not saying it's not a good story, but, but you know Well, I me. think that's the beauty of that book. Yeah. Is that it's it's a segue into apologetics? Yeah, you're interested in kind of the kind of the narrative of, of Lee Strobel's experience, Except but you're wasn't. also being exposed <laughs> to all these other great scholars right. like Habermas. And, and it was that the second else. part that I really wanted more of. And but then again, I'm not into stories, you know, yeah. like that. I mean, I, I'll, I'll, I think Lee Strobel's books are great. I've read about four of them, but you um, like stories. You don't like reading stories. Like you like fictional dramas and stuff on TV. Yeah, no, yeah, no. I'm just saying when I if I'm going to read something, I'm like, okay, this is neat. But I was I was I was more interested in getting to the nuts and bolts than I was the personal narrative. I got you. So, Uh, but bringing it back around. Yeah. So, what were you saying about that? You were doubting. You were going through a sentence. Right. And so it helped you in and that so, first way yes, and of so, firming up the faith. And I'm a big believer because I think it has also helped others. Yeah. I'm not, I can't be the only one. Well, no, I, I mean, Andy Armstrong, who right. was here, went through a point where he was really seriously doubting. And today, he's he's solidly believing. You yeah. know, he's and, 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 you know, is a solid Christian. So uh, but so there's a firming up. But then that second thing is... is um, to reach people who are, who are not saved. And I think there is biblical material for that, but some people don't even think that that counts. They don't even think that's part of it, which I'm kind of wondering, like, anytime you're def- you're actually defending, because you're not so much defending when you're talking to a believer who just doesn't understand. Right. And you, you are defending, but it's a soft defense. But when you're actually defending, when you're actually doing apologetics proper with someone who's not a Christian, aren't you always kind of doing that for the purpose yeah. of evangelism, like to see them become a Christian or in a debate so that those people watching can become a Christian. And if that's not what's on your mind, what is on your mind? And that kind of opens up, is it because you want to sound and feel smart? Is it because you're just a geek for apologetics and you would argue for Star Wars and Lord of the Rings with just as much passion as you do this There's stuff? There's some truth to that in yeah. both cases. Or you just sure. like the fight. 
Yeah, you like because I argue. admit I like the fight too, and I, I, I yeah. have to constantly fight that temptation. That well, it's okay to enjoy how God's gifted you in this way. I yeah, think. but I mean, if 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 but the, you, then you make it about you and just your personal enjoyment for sparring and not uh, right. Not, and yeah. I think that I think because of the way that people who are attracted to apologetics um, are built, that 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 temptation is always there, and I think part of that might be the pr- reason why people differentiate so strongly between uh, apologetics and evangelism is because they they don't want to think of evangelism as confrontational but that's not right either because evangelism is always confrontational it, you don't have to be combative so but it is confrontational. so here's why people have given as you just brought up an article we don't have to read it but it's a nine marks article from some time back where they were saying it was hard i was asking dr pritchett we're trying to figure out what are they worried about here? Yeah. What is it they're concerned with? Because they were trying to point out that apologetics is not evangelism, but there is a relationship there, and apologetics can help, but you don't have to use apologetics, and it can be a distraction, and I agree with all of that. But it was kind of like, what are you worrying about here? And the only thing Dr. Pritchett could come up with was, I think they're worried that people will think you have to know apologetics in order to do evangelism at all, and you don't have to know apologetics to do evangelism. Well, if that's your point, fine, great, granted. But the concern that people have had in evangelism, with not wanting to do evangelism or personal evangelism, church people, for decades has been, I might mess up. They may ask me something I don't know the answer to. And I don't want to be stuck in that situation where I don't know the answer to the question. So uh, I better not do it. Well, that's the same criticism why people talk. What they're saying there is they need apologetics. Yeah. And that's the same criticism with apologetics. And there are actually some Christian thinkers who will say, don't tell people who don't know a lot of apologetics to, to go out and to use it evangelistically because they could confirm someone in their skepticism because they don't know the answer. Well, there's a simple solution to both of these concerns. Go ahead and do evangelistic apologetics. Maybe you hardly know anything yet. Here's the solution. Number one, don't give answers that you don't have. Don't try to answer something. I like your phraseology where you say, um, preachers sometimes, and I was this way when I was a preacher, they feel like they got to thump the pulpit and say, thus saith the Lord, even though they might not know what the Lord thus saith about something, <laughs> right? right? And, and as long as you are willing to say, you know, I don't know the answer to that, but I'll go find out for you. And so the second thing is, here's what I encourage people to do. You can be, even if this podcast is the first time you've ever heard of apologetics, you can be an evangelistic apologist because though you may not be able to be a, uh, a 1 Peter 3.15 answer giver, you can be an answer finder for people and go find the answer and come back and talk to them about it. So I'm going to find a quote from someone who learned to do that. And while I do, I want you to talk about whatever. <laughs> well, thank you for <laughs> teeing that up for me. So I was watching a television show. No, I'm just kidding. But what I think about... You don't like stories. Yeah, no, I mean, what I mean is I don't... I just wanted to read the scholarship is what I was essentially trying to say with that is Lee Strobel's story is nice. I really wanted to get to the meat that he was talking about. But one of the things that I find with people who they want to do evangelism is exactly what you said. They don't know what to say. And the a lot of times these things push either a formula or, or a personal narrative mm-hmm. uh, about what what Jesus has done to change your life since you became a Christian and all that. I used to do this, this, and this, and now I do that, that, and that. Right. Uh, Peter never said, well, you know, I was a foul-mouthed fisherman, and and then uh, I met Jesus on the shore, and then I stopped cursing, and I drank less wine. And I mean, you just don't find that stuff in there. Um, but what you do find is, you know, defenses of the faith. And persuasion. And persuasion. Yeah. Uh, you know, if you like the Bible, I do. Yeah. If and if you want to learn learning the Bible, um, when you learn text, it requires a little bit of effort to 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 to, to learn yes. the, what it's talking about. Yes. Well, ap- apologetics is the same thing. It will require a little effort, but I think people would be more comfortable because. If they put forth a little bit of effort and learn the apologetics, they'd be more comfortable in doing evangelism. Bam. Stop right there. Okay. That is the point. I, we didn't plan that, but you said exactly what I needed right. you to say. Because I have a testimony here from 
um, someone who attended a small group, an apologetic small group that I was putting on at a church. I can see the church, Pritchett, yeah. down the road. Um, and now, this is, in fact, I'll just tell you, this is Sarah Hicks. She used to be Sarah Medesis, but she got married. And there's actually another podcast here at Trinity called Trinity Team. And I want you to go listen to that. It talks about our school and all that sort of thing. And it's got um, Adam Roth, who I call Sensei Roth, who was on one of these episodes. And it's got Sarah Hicks. Sarah Hicks is an apologetics student at our school, and she knows apologetics better than a lot of our a lot of pastors do, you know? Yeah. And here's what she said after attending our small group. She said, I'm currently a student working toward an end goal of a doctoral degree in apologetics and theology. I'm also a youth director and a member of the worship band at my church, the coordinator of a Thursday night apologetics class for college students, and a sixth to eighth grade Sunday school teacher. I cannot stress enough the importance of a strong foundation of biblical knowledge and apologetics. These things are necessary to be able to defend your faith, which all Christians are called to do. 1 Peter 3.15 says, But in your hearts honor Christ the Lord as, as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you, yet do it gent with gentleness and respect. Knowing God's word as well as arguments for his existence and for the resurrection of Christ make this, different, uh, this defense possible for us and will create a byproduct, Pritchett, a byproduct of confidence to share our faith. A lack of this confidence is one of the biggest things that holds people back from spreading the good news. If you don't feel confident that you'll have answers to questions you may be asked, it's much scarier to witness to others. Sarah Jane Hicks. Yes, and she, I think she's absolutely right because that's what I've seen with people. Just you know, just people in the church. They're. It's not that they're not excited about Jesus. It's not that they don't want to see people get saved. It's that. They don't want to. They don't want to dishonor Christ by be looking foolish, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and so, I think it's the job of pastors and teachers and others to equip them with this. And it doesn't take a lot because chances are, unless you come across a philosophy professor at McDonald's, yeah, the people you're going to talk to are not going to be all that advanced. And what I've learned when you deal with with atheists. Um, it's striking. One of the things I've learned is uh, being friends with people that are atheists on Facebook, but also being friends with them in the community. You know, like they live down the road from you. Yeah, they might be nice people. They're geniuses when they have access to Google. <laughs> but when you tell them, smart, smartphone on the table. Yeah, if you now talk with them in meet space. Right. Yeah. Let, let's let's let, now let's let's have this conversation where you can't go Google Richard Dawkins' answer to question one hundred and one right. that I have to wait for. Uh, and you can always tell when you're on Facebook because it'll be a few seconds. It'll be like a couple of minutes. They got to go find right. It. You're like, wait a minute. This yeah. post was going back and forth, back and forth, and now you're gone. Yeah. All yeah. of a sudden, but I found this. They don't know anything. So if if the church does its job in educating people um, with the, I mean, at this point, we've been doing this for long enough. I can come up with a you know the top ten things you need to. Hey, there's a book. The top ten things you need to learn in apologetics to be an effective. Witness well, and Mark Mark Middleberg has uh, Mark Middleberg yeah. now a friend of mine. Yeah, uh, has a book. Uh, it's something like ten things Christians hope unbelievers won't ask, or something like that. Right, and those ten things are the things. The, the most well, yeah. good. Somebody's yeah. written that book. We yeah. don't have to. Um, <laughs> but you you get that down, and ninety percent of the people you will encounter. You'll have no problem. But but ninety percent of the people you're going to encounter in meat space, you know, in real life aren't going to be these YouTube atheists. They're going to be nice people yes, who want to be good parents, and just like you do, and help little old ladies across the street, and they're not sucking the blood of children. You know, they're, they're, and, and those kind of people are sometimes open. They just don't know. Like, it's a willful deception. We say, you know, Romans 1, that whole yeah. thing. But the thing is, they, want to know, they might really want to know why, because they know you're a smart person. You're reasonably well educated. Why do you believe this stuff? And they may be open yeah. to hear. I have seen people come to Christ who are genuinely open. Yeah. In fact, if I've never shared this before, I know you're sick of me reading things, Pritchard. Are you cool? I'm cool. Okay. Uh, there was a lady in our church, and I say this is a local church because I don't want you to think that I went out and drummed this up somewhere and fabricated no, it. that church. But right? yeah, the church I can see out the window here. There was a woman who had a son who had become an atheist. And uh, he wanted, he, but he was open, you know, he wanted to hear what Christians had to say about this stuff. So I began sharing with him my core facts uh, presentation, um, which is best for a multiple encounter evangelism. We're going to have more than one chance to talk to someone. And this is what he had to say. 
Uh, we met for lunch at a local Mexican restaurant, which, by the way, I don't know why this is, but Mexican restaurants are great places to have apologetic discussions. Yes, and a great uh, place in period. You know, just the <laughs> flour and the cheese and everything is yes. flowing and your defenses are down, I guess. Is there no Mexican restaurant in downtown Evansville? There's not. That I know of. Man, awful. Anyway. That's a missing... There could be. Yes. Hey, Think of all hey, the people hey. going to hell right now. Hey. <laughs> we can't have a Yeah, that's right. <laughs> hey, I got a business proposition for you. Right. Uh, but anyway, um, so he said, we met for lunch at a local Mexican restaurant, and that's when my life really changed for the better. We continued meeting and discussing God and the truth about Jesus. I was baffled at how much evidence there really is. No one had ever talked to me about Christian apologetics. It surprised me to hear that there were people out there that are trying to give evidence for God's existence and who Jesus was. Apologetics made me take a second look at what religion was and why Christianity is worth believing. That's in an article called Away from Atheism on my website. He did a guest blog article. And so he became a Christian ultimately. And so that was using apologetics. Now, what do the scholars say about this? Is there a scholar who agrees? Uh, sure there is. You might expect. William Lane Craig, we've already said. Yeah. Here's what he has to say. Lee Strobel recently remarked to me that he has lost count of the number of people who have come to Christ through his books, The Case for Christ, The Case for Faith. Nor, if I may speak personally, Craig says, has it been my experience that apologetics is ineffective in evangelism. We continually are thrilled to see people committing their lives to Christ through apologetically oriented presentations of the gospel. Bam. After a talk on arguments for the existence of God or evidence for the resurrection of Jesus or a defense of Christian particularism, 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 Whatever. I'll sometime particularism. I know what it is. <laughs> I know what it is. Come on. I knew that. I'll sometimes conclude with a prayer of commitment. A prayer of commitment. In an apologetics, in a debate. Yeah. Yeah, there are people that get on to you just for doing that without apologetics. Yeah. Ridiculous. To give one's life to Christ. And the comment cards indicate those who have registered such a commitment. Just this past spring, Craig says, I did a speaking tour of universities in central Illinois, and we were thrilled to see that almost every time I gave such a presentation, students indicated decisions for Christ. Amen. Now, that's a, that's a man who's not a, you know, a lot of the criticism comes, you know, from our Reformed brethren, yes. right? Because, and I, here's the only, now, Calvinists have great, Apologists, right? They they have some apologists that are getting the job done. But are you trying? Are you struggling okay. to think of one? Is that what's going on here? <laughs> okay, no, no they, they've got it. They, there's a history. I'm teasing. I'm teasing. Yeah, there's, there's some of my favorite. Uh, Greg Bonson. Um, oh yeah, a big fan of his. Disciple um, of Van Til. Yeah, um, and Douglas Wilson is a out carries that forth today. Yeah, you know. So yeah, there's some good ones out there. Frame. John Frame, I'm going to read a quote from him next. In fact, you just teed me up for that, didn't you? But a lot of the criticism comes because even though there are a lot of Calvinists who do... Well, uh, R.C. Sproul is a classical apologist. Mm -hmm. Wrote a book on why that's the better approach, is classical apologist. Lost so, a debate with Greg Bonson on <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> really? Yeah, they had a debate on I that. I was unaware of that. Yeah. Learn something new every day. But the... I think the criticism I comes... I say he lost. I'm sure the, other people the, would... The criticism think. comes because... I, I'm saying that a lot, of, a lot of Calvinists are apologists and like apologetics. So it's not like, if you, it's not like a criticism of Calvinism in general, okay? There's plenty of those. But, um, <laughs> but, the, but the thing and about half it... half our audience. No, no, no. They, 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 they like they, us. They, they, I love Calvinists. I love them. But here's the thing. I love Calvinists, but they make mountains out of molehills. Yes, the or they believe God determinatively made mountains out of molds. <laughs> right. And the sinner's prayer is awful. But, and I'm saying, I mean, but, but this plays into what we're saying yeah. is they're the some of them, a subset, are the ones that say, why would you use apologetics for evangelism when you can't do that? Like the spirit's got to do that. Yeah. Right? What do you think you're gonna get? This is Greg Monson right here. Who do you think you are to get down in the dirt with a skeptic? This is a criticism of classical apologetics from his yeah. approach. You get down in the dirt with a critic and argue up to God's existence, their minds are cognitively fallen, and so they can't do that. They're never going to be there. God's got to irresistibly grace them. Right? Yeah. I'm, am I not being fair? And the response is, um, God uses means. So even hey, if Absolutely. Reformed, so even if you're Reformed, apologetics could be a means by which... Um, God uses to bring someone a skeptic or a because a it's because you can see how passionate I am. Yes, it's almost like this is a centerpiece of my ministry. Yes, <laughs> but because 
I would, a good apologetic presentation, one will always include, what do you think? I'm going to say. A gospel message. Yeah, the resurrection and the gospel. Yeah. And, and, and that means it is the preaching of the gospel. Yes. Because what is preaching? Proclamation of the truth. Yes. Right? So this, this, this proclamation evangelism, as we might call it, that doesn't include apologetics is a presentation of the gospel using personal stories, experience, you know, stuff like that, scripture, all those things. I uh, guess what? An apologetic presentation of the gospel is a presentation of the gospel using some data and some evidence. What's, what's the big deal? And besides, those people that got saved that way, that God used apologetics as the means for them, yeah. I'm sure they are all about it. Yeah, you, know? you can even give an altar call. Do you want to read this? I've been reading stuff. No. Okay. You can even play just as I am 50,000 times while you yes. do that altar call. It's a good one to you. know. And then when they respond to the altar call, you can say a sinner's prayer with them. You know, someone was making fun of After just an as apology, I am. Yeah. And, uh, it's a good song. Why some, would you make fun of it? Someone on our... Uh, because it's just stereotypical of altar calls. Right. We play it at our church. But, you know, the thing is, someone who's a Calvinist on, mm-hmm. our, on our internet forum that we're in yeah. was like, you know... I got to admit, I, even, you know, I've always thought that song was just so powerful that at the altar call, he said, before I was a Christian, I had to s- squeeze the pew in front of me to keep yeah. myself from going forward. So I'll admit there's something about that song. <laughs> yeah, it's a great yeah. song. If it's good enough for Billy Graham, it's good enough for me. But as we said before, the lack of Mexican restaurants has sent more people to hell than the Sinner's <laughs> Prayer has. That's I'd like to see the syllogism for it. <laughs> How are we going to frame that up? Well, the Sinner's Prayer has sent more people to hell than anything in the world, whatever claims that is. is, yeah. is, is I can make one equally ridiculous. Oh, I see. I thought you were being genuine. But my equally ridiculous one probably is a little bit more right, true than, right. than the nonsensical claims. Okay, so let's take a Calvinist scholar, John Frame. Yes. And here's what he has to say. You actually told me about this. And I found it. I like John Frame. John Frame says, Well, there's a lot of argument among apologetes as to how to do apologetics. I think that when you're witnessing, apologetics is part of evangelism. Not a good segue into evangelism, yeah. not pre-evangelism. Apologetics is part of evangelism. Yes. Apologetics is part of our witness, he says. The easiest thing is simply to tell them what the Bible says, but you know it can become more complicated. It's John Frame. Yeah, but see, here's the thing I like about John Frame. Number one, he's not a Reformed Baptist. And when I read my Calvinists, I get it from the real Calvinists. No offense, Reformed Baptists. <laughs> uh, no, I all my I do that to joke to the five Reformed Baptists I pick on all the time. Yeah. But they know what I think. Um, and shout out to Les Prouty because he knows that I think he's a real Calvinist because he's a Presbyterian. Yeah, and I love the because they get it. It's all it's typically the David Platts and all these guys who you know are out there trying to poo-poo, sinner's prayer, and evangelistic methods and all that. It's not... These Presbyterian guys, they don't jump on those Reformed Baptist bandwagons quite so bad. And he gets it, too, when it's about evangelism, because, you know, for me, it wasn't until I saw, going back full circle, the incorporation of apologetics in evangelism that I finally got the point of it. I was like, okay... That's the point. Because to me, if it's just about arguing with people, and even just, you know, unless you become William Lane Craig to where, you know, you get these big debates and you get to give the presentations and all that, it's just a bunch of people with degrees that fuss at other people without degrees on the Internet. And I'm like, this is a, no, this is not what it's about. Because the one thing that I always tell people in my contemporary apologetics two class is get off the (laughs) Internet and get in your neighborhood. You know, Amen. talk to real people. Now, okay, I, I know you're sick of me reading things. Are you still cool? I never was sick of you okay. reading things. Okay, because I'm going to get, we need to get some scripture up in her. What do you think? Mm-hmm. Okay. Because <laughs> so, that's another criticism. <laughs> <laughs> the Bible is, I'd rather. The Bible is incompatible with, with the inclusion of apologetics and evangelism. Yes. There's no biblical basis for it. Is that true? Well, I just released a. Another video arguing uh, that that that's not true. Right. But here, but here, I'm just going to quickly read. This won't take long. 
This is Paul at the Areopagus in Athens speaking with these trained philosophers, and here's what he has to say, or here's what it says. So Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I observe that you are very religious in all respects, for while I was passing through and examining the objects of your worship, I also found an altar with this inscription, To an unknown God. By the way, we found those. We found all. We found um, uh, monuments that look like they said to unknown gods, and it could be plural or singular. Mm-hmm. But it's broken off because, like, and and there's a couple of theories on this. One theory is that uh, that they did it like most preachers think they did it, where it's like uh, just in case there's one we don't know about. But uh, really, what pro- what may be the case is. Because Paul, the city of Athens, there's altars and monuments were there everywhere, and there's more than one altar to them. Right, and so what? And the reason probably is because inclement weather or some siege or something. Some of these get knocked down or destroyed or something, and so they don't no, they don't know which, which, one it was. which all which god it was because <laughs> they got so many. So they set this up and they say unknown god. You know, or whatever. So, but anyway, uh, that doesn't hurt the application of it because Paul no. is using it to say. However it came about, yes, I'm going to tell you about that God that you don't know about. Mm -hmm. Therefore, what you worship in ignorance, this I proclaim to you, the God who made the world and all things in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything. Since he himself gives to all people life and breath and all things, and he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined their appointed times and the boundaries of their habitation, that they would seek God, if perhaps they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and exist, as even some of your own poet, poets, pagan poets, have said. For we also are his children. Being then the children of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and thought of man. Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God is now declaring to men that all people everywhere should repent because he has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed having furnished proof proof you know in apologetics they always tell us like at biola they would tell you i'm sure and we've said it here too that like don't overstate your case don't say you have proof so you have really good evidence yeah. well got news for you paul says proof yeah. <laughs> yeah that's that was number two number one is be winsome which i got sick of hearing you don't consider yourself to be winsome We'll leave that to the audience. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, so by raising him from the dead, that's the proof. Okay. And then at that point, you know what happens? It falls apart. Paul doesn't fall apart. They fall apart. And it, some sneered, some wish to hear more, and some uh, believe. Yes. Right. Okay. So of this, so what, okay. So this is an apologetic, I want to argue this is evangelistic apologetics. I could Paul's argue that from Stephen. I could argue that from Yeah, because he can... actually, it looks like, quotes Stephen directly in part of this. And yeah. part of that sermon. You can go back to Acts chapter 7, and it's like yeah. identical, almost word by word, which, you know, he was there. If that's if that's Saul yeah. is the became Paul, which yeah. anyone who argues against that, I think it's silly. But, right? I agree. Okay. All right, so, so okay. So, of course it was. Here's what Ben Witherington III has to say about this. Verse 23b, which is the part about the altar to an unknown God, mm-hmm. strikes a balance notable throughout the whole rest of the speech throughout the whole speech, between making contact with the audience and condemning their idolatry. Apologetics by means of defense and attack is being done, using Greek thought to make monotheistic points. Mm -hmm. It is not an exercise in diplomacy or compromise, but ultimately a call for conversion. So it's it's apologetics and it's evangelism. It's evangelistic apologetics, it looks like Mm -hmm. Witherington is saying. right? Yes, and he's absolutely correct. And I won't read this whole quote, but I'll just say... I think it's Daryl Bach. It could be David Garland. But one of them says that they think the whole reason that Paul includes this speech, or that Luke includes this speech, is because he was trying to give a template to people of the day for trying to evangelize philosophically trained Greeks that they might encounter. So, but what blows my mind is there are people out there. In fact, I think you said you were surprised to hear these people exist. But there are people out there who will argue that Paul messed up here. Because after this, we know he goes to Corinth, and if you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, 
he's saying, I'm not coming, you know, with, uh, I'm, I'm just coming to preach Christ and crucify. I may be getting that out of order, but, but he, he says, you know, he's here with fear and trembling or weakness and whatever. Right? Yes. And I'm, I know I'm butchering it. Don't look at me it's like fine. that. I'm not being very scholarly about it, but it's, it's fine. Normally I have it in front of me. <laughs> but the whole point is it looks like he... he says all those things. That's yeah, he point. says it all there. You know? <laughs> uh, and people say, well, look, he, the reason he's that way is because he's in 1 Corinthians, he's referring to when he first came to Corinth. And when was, was that? Right, yeah, right, right after the Areopagus yeah. event. And so what is going on, if you put all that together, is he got all messed up because it didn't work. And so he changed his approach Yeah, when you showed me these scholars saying that, I was like, no, that's not, number one, I don't think that's what he meant by I aim to preach only Christ and him crucified. That's not. Speaking of the mic a little bit better. Okay. That's not what he meant by that. And I was blown away when you showed me the sources where people were saying this. I'm like, what in the world? Plus, is that even true? Like he says, I came to preach Christ and him crucified. Is that even right? Like I, he did preach that, so yes. that's so he's not lying. He wanted to know nothing among them, but right. but <laughs> in First Corinthians fifteen, he goes, "Here's the gospel I preached to you: Jesus was dead, buried, Christ and him crucified, yeah. and he rose again. <laughs> and here's what the resurrection body's like. <laughs> right. So he's and getting, if it didn't rise from the dead, our faith is useless right. and all sorts of stuff. Right. Yeah. So it's not the point is what he, I think, and the scholars, a lot of the scholars tend to agree. He wasn't saying I'm not. I don't care about reason anymore. Right. What he was saying was, I'm not going to give one of these uh, impressive demonstrations of philosophical flamboyance like right. was so popular during the day right. for entertainment, like Apollos, right? Like Apollos <laughs> probably did, yeah. right? So, um, but it, but you know, how, but here's the here's the uh, what do you call it? The smoking gun, yeah. right? That proves I think my case proves it proves it. Don't use that word. (laughs) If you go back to Acts 18. He went some. (laughs) Right after Acts 17 in Acts 18, where we do get that he went to Corinth and all that. Guess what? It immediately says that he does. He goes into the synagogue and begins trying to persuade. Which is exactly what he says in 2 Corinthians 5, too. You know, be reconciled, you know, pleading with people to be reconciled. So it's just. So he uses apologetics before, during, and after the Areopagus event. He kept using evangelistic apologetics. So this idea that somewhere he stopped doing it, I don't know where the building. And when he started at. using personal testimony in his evangelism, didn't it didn't go? Well. <laughs> Is your thesis? Well, it didn't have the same results. Yeah. you know, I mean, at least some believed at the Areopagus. I mean, yeah, the, the, he, but is it even? Yeah, is it even true that he, he it didn't work? No, some sneered. Okay, some wanted to hear more. Okay, and and I'll, I'll go with the scholars that say. They probably didn't really want to hear more. They were just being conscientious as they shut him down. Like, that's enough of that, Paul. We'll hear you later. You know? Right. But even with that, and then some believed. Do you think those that believed at the Areopagus think it didn't work? You know, I mean, I remember Billy Graham saying one time, or, or hearing this story about him, that he had preached and, uh, like, only one person had become a Christian. Now, that's that's weird, isn't it? Because we're yeah. used to seeing those stadium things. Right. But he he was crying in the car. And his like crew was like, oh, he's sad, you know, because only one person. He probably feels like a failure. And and someone said, you know, uh, brother Billy, don't don't cry about this. It's fine. And he said, I'm crying because just think, one person was lost and on their way to hell, and now they're saved and on their way to heaven. Amen. Isn't that great? You know what I'm thinking? <laughs> that's the man we're dealing with there, yeah. and that should be our attitude. And I'll tell you what, that's gotten me through some rough weeks <laughs> when I was when I was traveling and preaching more than I am now. But yeah, that happens every time the gospel is presented and skeptics are there. Yeah, I think, and I think you've had a lot to do with this, but I think that um, we're coming out of this idea that the two are distinct and never shall the twain meet, or they only link up in certain situations or whatever. Because I'm convinced that for the 21st century, now and going forward, and probably for the last 10 years or so, that evangelism without apologetics is going to be fruitless. I mean, there's you, you're well, not getting uh, and, and this culture, spe- yeah. especially in urban cultures, you got it's it's you just got to have it. I mean, we were talking to a pastor um, here in your office, who the number one thing he needs his people trained on is apologetics, apologetics because yeah. they're encountering the objections to the faith whenever they're doing their evangelism and they're outgoing and they're evangelistic and they're winning souls and they say, yeah. we need more of this. This is what we're encountering. Yeah, I need my people to know. Because right. there's a medical research center coming to Evansville downtown 
and there's yeah. going to be a bunch of PhDs walking around, and he wants and MDs and all sorts of other talk people. Yeah. So let's try to wind it down. I would say this: the pow- there's power in the gospel message, yes. right? And so I think it does penetrate the heart of man. Yes. What apologetics does in evangelism is it tears away a lot of the roadblocks, a lot of the smoke screen. Because I agree with Ravi Zacharias, there's usually something else going on besides just an intellectual objection. And this tears it away. But I'm going to close with a quote from a man that they're going to be shocked that I would quote. Matt Slick. Matt Slick of Karm.org. This is what this evangelistic apologist, who's a Calvinist, has to say. We've quoted a bunch of Calvinists. Nevertheless, apologetics and evangelism are related. When needed, apologetics is a means by which the way is both prepared and protected so that the message of the gospel can properly be presented. I love this. Apologetics is like a soldier who battles to protect the messenger who has the gospel to deliver. It's even got a rhythm to it like a preacher, you know? But apologetics is like a soldier who protects the messenger who's got the gospel to deliver. That's great. Does that... So is he a part of the delivering of the message? Yes. Yes. Is it re- are, so? Are they related? Yes, both are true. These are not mutually yeah. exclusive concepts. So I just encourage you. Um, I agree with these articles. You don't have to absolutely know apologetics to share the gospel and see people saved. But as Dr. Pritchett says, it is becoming more and more an unavoidable thing that you need to go out of your way to try and understand. And I, I get it, folks. The thing that scares people most in the church is sharing their faith because Mm -hmm. they're uncomfortable with it. They think they won't do it right. And then you're giving them apologetics, which they're also uncomfortable with and don't think they can do it right. And basically what me and Dr. Pritchard are doing right now is saying, let's take both those things, put them together. How about that? Can you do that? (laughs) And and, and I want to close with this and why I think that those of you... Here's why I think people shied away from the personal testimony thing, why it makes them uncomfortable. Because we live in a culture now where you give your personal testimony and someone's going to say... Well, that's great. That that works for you. Right. That's yeah. true for you. Right. And so that shuts down the conversation with somebody who's already awash in pluralism and relativism. Yeah. So apologetics cleans out that gutter, you know, and and puts it back on the road. And so I think if people were equipped with the information, and if they would get a book like Core Facts, for example, uh, written by Dr. Braxton Hunter, um, they could easily ingest this stuff. I and think they so. can easily communicate this stuff when they when they witness to people, and then you don't have to talk about yourself. You know, well, I, I used to be a dope head, and I, you know, I got drunk every day, and then I met Jesus, and it all stopped. Well, great. I mean, that's fine to include. You know, you know, some people relate to stories. You know, some people relate to your. Pre- but it, but you're right. It's, yeah. Some people they don't care. About well, that was actually story. my church. Yeah. I used to smoke dope and drink, and then I met Jesus. But. Uh, <laughs> But I was saying, I don't. That's not my way to talk about people, and and when talk about it in evangelism, because I always encounter that. Well, that works for you. That's good. And for it you. means that you're going to be telling someone, no, it doesn't work. Just work for me. It's objectively the truth about the way the world is. Yeah. Now, if somebody says, well, that you're just being arrogant or whatever, I've never understood that. I mean, I get why they say it. But I've never understood that criticism because. It's the most humble thing to do is to say, I can't help you, and you can't help you, right. and no one else on earth can help you, but he's over there. He can help you, Jesus. Yeah. He can help you. I'm not telling you I've got something special. He's right. got it. Let's go with him. And so um, let's just say here in the end that, number one, uh, Trinity is a place where you can come and learn how to do evangelistic apologetics. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, we have programs just for that. Imagine that. Yeah. An apologetics degree that is useful. Yeah. I'm kidding. Yeah, that's, no, you're not. That no, is I'm useful. not. You're kidding. It is useful. Right. The part you were saying you're kidding about is that other schools don't have that. And now you're saying, right, they, we, we're not kidding. They don't, some of them. Right? Yeah, I'm fine with that. Yeah. So um, come here to Trinity. Visit us at trinitysem, trinitysem.edu. You'll see trinitysem.edu written here in the banner right in front of me right now that also has the email where you can contact us and ask us any question you want. We'll talk about it here Absolutely. Um, and try to answer it as best we can. If you want to see people get saved and you love apologetics, come to Trinity. If you want to be like the people Dr. Braxton rags about on the back of his book... You should still come to Trinity and stop being that guy. Yeah. And uh, 
uh, I know you were trying to let that be the last thing, but I also want to tell them that visit us uh, for just free apologetic content at BraxtonHunter.com. I would love it if you get my book Evangelistic Apologetics or the book Core Facts. Well, you can get Dr. Pritchett's book. Oh, wait. No, you can't. Not yet. <laughs> yeah. But uh, you will be able to maybe by the end of the year. Maybe. Okay. And uh, uh, also check out uh, Trinity Team. Um, which is a new podcast. That Sarah Hicks on, and Sensei Roth. Yeah, they're a little easier on the eyes than we are probably. Probably. <laughs> but you go check so. that out and share that around to people that you think might be interested in Trinity. And um, I'll look forward to seeing you back here for the next episode of Trinity Radio. Trinity Radio.